first question, just curious how this whole alphabet situation has changed your job and your approach at Google Ventures. Well, thanks, Emily. Good to see you. Um, it's really business as usual for us. We've always operated independently, made our own investment decisions, and invested apart from Google's product uh, roadmap. So uh, not much has changed for us. So you had a role in the formation of Calico, which is Google's efforts to extend our lifespan. What are some concrete examples of progress there and opportunities you see to really extend our lives? I think the opportunity in the life sciences is really hard to understate at this point in time. I think the change that we're going to see between now and the next 20 years is going to be similar to what we've seen happen in communications over the last 20 years, where you can talk to anyone, anywhere, anytime by video, essentially for free, and 20 years ago you would write a letter. And that's a pretty big change, and I think we're going to see a similar change uh, enabled by uh, computational uh, capabilities over the next 20 years in healthcare, and I'm really excited about it. So let's talk about investment opportunities. I mean, give us some specifics. What are the most interesting and exciting opportunities you see out there right now? Well, we look at the healthcare ecosystem uh, as a uh, as a continuum. So, so there's diagnostics, there's therapeutics, uh, there's payer systems, um, there's uh, devices. Uh, so there's a lot of different areas in healthcare, and when you apply uh, machine learning and, and new technology to each of those areas, there's some pretty exciting opportunities. And just to give you one example, uh, Editas is a company we've invested in uh, in the gene editing space, which is something that would have been hard to even imagine 15 years ago as a company, uh, but it holds great promise to uh, hopefully treat a number of diseases that uh, are really untreatable right now. Now, I know this idea of immortality is, is very fascinating to you. I was recently speaking with Sebastian Thrun, uh, the founder of Google X, about the same thing. And, and he said that he thinks that we will significantly be able to extend our lives in our lifetime. And, and the question is, is really, why don't humans live to 200 years? I mean, how far along are, are we in that process, Bill? I mean, are we really going to see an additional 10, 20 years added to our lives in our lifetime? I'm always really careful to talk about that because when we say in our lifetime, none of us really know what our lifetime is. You know, I could I could say yes and walk outside and get hit by a bus. I mean, these things happen. But I think in a reasonable amount of time, I think we can see real improvements in treating a number of diseases. And and I think to talk about uh, immortality is a is a is a good way to kind of take it to its extreme. But we're talking about the realities of science, and um, and I think when we think about that. We have to think about the fact that we have the ability to extend life right now. So uh, if we just, a lot of people talk about the redistribution of, of wealth, and I like to think about the redistribution of health. And so uh, when I think about that, the average lifespan in the U.S. is something like 70 to 80 years, but in Western Africa, it's about 40. And we have the ability right now with our existing technology to extend life. It's just a matter of do we have the commitment uh, to, to really see it through uh, and globally and not just in this country. Now I want to talk about your uh, opinion on, on Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, you recently told Business Insider, we looked at Theranos a couple of times, but there was so much hand-waving, like, look over here, that, you know, we just couldn't figure it out. So we had someone from our life science investment team go into Walgreens, take the test, and it wasn't that difficult for anyone to determine that things may not be what they seem here. Now, she responded to you at the Wall Street Journal conference saying, he's never met with us, he's never reached out to us. If he just wants to talk badly about us, he's free to talk badly about us. It's a free country. What really happened? Well, I, I think the first part of what you said is exactly true. We had someone from our team go and take the test, and uh, instead of one vial of blood, or one nano container of blood, it turned into five with the follow-up call several days later looking for even more blood. And it just was apparent that uh, it, things were not what they seemed. And, and I think it's really important uh, because when you're dealing in the life sciences, you're dealing with a really vulnerable population of people, patients, that are banking on some of the promises of this new technology. So you have to be really careful about the claims that you make. And I think in this case, what's been written about the company and what's been, what is being written, I think speaks for itself. You know, obviously if, if what she's saying is possible really is possible, that's amazing. But it is really scary to me that a company could raise money at a $10 billion valuation 
if there really isn't that much there. I mean, Bill, what do you think actually happened here? Do you think maybe they just got too, too far ahead of themselves? You know, I read a really interesting Quora uh, answer to this question just yesterday. And I think what happened, I think there's a lot of culpability and a lot, the media has something to do with it, getting carried away with a story and not really looking into the science. I mean, we've got life science companies that we invest in. 23andMe is a great example. They've, they've published over 40 peer review articles uh, on their science and no one's ever questioned the accuracy of the data that they're providing to consumers. Right. And in this case, said, you have a company Theranos that hasn't, hasn't published provided. a single paper. Theranos hasn't yeah, provided any of the data. And that's part that's of correct. the problem. So, and whatever we would ask, the media would ask Elizabeth Holmes about the, the data and the technology, they would say it was a trade secret. Which makes me wonder why so many magazines put her on the cover of put her on the cover, and she's on the board, kind of on the board of fellows of Harvard, Harvard Medical School, from what I understand. And uh, and I don't know that any of those folks have seen the science behind it because there hasn't been a single peer-reviewed journal article about it. Now you're also an investor in, in 23andMe, which just saw. A, a pretty major comeback after its own run-ins with the FDA. I just yesterday sat down with Ann Wojcicki and she talked about how far they've come. Take a listen. I feel great. Like I, I'm, uh, I'm super proud of the company and what we've accomplished because I think when you have to slog through and you just have to put your head down and know that there's a lot of work ahead of you and you're not going to see a reward for a couple years, um, it's hard. And, you know, we had an incredible retention rate. Um, people stayed and people were determined and they worked through it. And I think actually even with the launch, um, I almost feel like that was just, like we just climbed the first flight of stairs, but we're still climbing the Empire State Building. So we just, there's a lot more to go. And so for me, part of what I think about too is pacing, is that we have, it's, it's amazing. We're back on the market. Um, we, have, um, we have an incredible product. We've completely redesigned everything. And what I'm really excited about is that this is the first chapter in a whole new book for 23andMe. You're going to see that full interview on an upcoming episode of Studio 1.0. But Bill, how would you compare 23andMe's situation with the FDA, with what we're seeing with Theranos? And what is your vision for the future of this, you know, return to 23andMe? I mean, apart from the fact that they're both companies, I don't see much of a similarity. I mean, 23andMe... As the, the, that team has put their nose to the grindstone over the last two years and worked extremely hard with the FDA to get over some regulatory hurdles to uh, be able to bring their product to market, which is really different from having the very basis of, the, of, of do you actually have a product and does, does, it, does it work and is it accurate uh, be questioned. Those are two, it's really different to try something that's difficult and run into roadblocks and work through them to uh, to, uh, to claim that you have something and have no evidence that it actually exists. Those are really different situations. Now, I want to talk to you also about robotics and AI. This is something else that you've had a longstanding interest in. Are you still seeing good opportunities out there, or have they all been bought by Google and Facebook already? You know, I think the question of AI and machine learning, it's, it's not so much looking for general AI companies to invest in for us. Uh, that artificial intelligence is it's all around us. It's on your phone. Your phone helps you uh, find where to go. It can tell you the weather. There, there's artificial intelligence in your car. There's, there have been computer games that can beat the greatest chess masters in the world for many years. So it, it's around us. It's a, it's a layer on top of a lot of the companies that we invest in that are helping to accelerate some of their innovations. And we're seeing other companies like Uber, for example, become more interested in, in artificial intelligence. Google Ventures, of course, a big investor in Uber. How much of GV's success is predicated on that investment? And how complicated is it now that Google obviously makes self-driving cars and Uber is working on its own self-driving cars? Well, I would say our investment in Uber isn't successful yet. The company's still growing and faces hurdles and challenges, and so I'd be really careful to say that, that I don't think any success that we might have is predicated on the company because they've got a lot, a lot of hard work ahead of them, and we're trying to support them in that. So how then would you describe your relationship with Uber right now, given that to some extent they're trying to compete with Google, at least on the driverless car front, and some would say mapping? 
You know, when a company gets to, any company gets to a certain kind of breakout size, they're going to compete with lots of things, but whether it's Google, Facebook, other companies in our portfolio of investments, and that's not a surprise to us. That that happens, and and when we first met with Travis, the, the, the idea of a self-driving car existed, so so no one is shocked by by this development, and, uh, and you know, we're investors in Uber, so we're big believers in, uh, in Travis and that team, and we have lots of friends that work there. So we really would like to see them succeed. Now, I would love to get your thoughts on the environment right now. Are you seeing more down rounds out there? Where are we in this sort of funding super cycle? Uh, this, is, this is when investing in startups becomes a spectator sport. Uh, that's when I start to worry about things. And I lived through 1999 and 2000 uh, when it started to become a real spectator sport. And I think we're kind of into that uh, area again. And I think uh, 99 to 2000 was a period where companies that had no business going public were going public much too soon. And now we're in an era where the pendulum has swung the other way, where companies that uh, probably should go public or are ready to go public are waiting much longer uh, than maybe they should in some cases. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before uh, the pendulum swings back the other way as well. So what does that look like? And, and what are the biggest warning signs out there that you're seeing? I think it looks like you know you have these these billion dollar plus valuation companies, some of which will do really well and be the foundational companies, technology companies of the future, and and some that won't do very well because it wasn't the right time or the people worked hard and it didn't work out, and and because the valuations are high and they get a lot of attention, uh, when uh, when they don't succeed, they'll probably get a lot of attention as well. And so, when people ask the bubble question. And to me, what they really mean is, is someone about to lose a lot of money? And at those valuations, when companies don't succeed, there is money to be lost. And it's just it's part of the startup life cycle. And so, um, again, none of that is really surprising to me. I just think it's uh, part of the business cycle that we're in.